Good morning. Will you please join me in the call to worship, which is a prayer and is based on James 5, 13 through 20. Are any among you suffering? Are any cheerful? Are any among you sick? The prayer of faith will save us. Scripture this morning is from the book of James, chapter 5, verses 13 
through 20. Are any among you suffering? They should pray. Are any cheerful? They should sing songs of praise. Are any among you sick? They should call for the elders of the church and have them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise them up and anyone who has committed sins will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being like us, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth yielded its harvest. My brothers and sisters, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and is brought back by another, you should know that whoever brings back a sinner from wandering will save the sinner's soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I share with you now the names that are on our prayer request list for this week. The family of Cheryl Krieger Morgan, who passed away this past Tuesday. Also Barney Lilly, Eric Lips, Susan Perry, Pat and Ralph Burchett, Jamie Withrow, Sarah Pemberton Rat Rat Ratliff, Rod Allen Quinn, Teresa Myers, Erica Windham, Helen Chapman, Derek, Cindy, and Gus Biondi, Sam Femia, Bill Jeanette, Connie Rollins, and David Moore. Let us pray. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, who has rescued us from those who would destroy us. Your power and might are great, and your mercy is poured out on us whom you love. Our help is in your blessed name. O you who have made heaven and earth, we have been entrusted with the way of life, for your word has dwelt among us. But we have become so puffed up with our own importance that we ignore the simplest acts of mercy. You have called us to be like salt, adding flavor to life. Yet we lose our sense of mission and cease to be all that you have called us to be. Deliver us from judgment and forgive our sin that we may live forever in your presence and sing your praises for eternity. By the gift of your spirit, Help us to see that we share your task of evangelism with many people from many different places. May our work be done for the common purpose of spreading the gospel of Christ. We lift up before you this day our brothers and sisters who are in distress by the ministry of laying on of hands and anointing and prayer, we have confidence that as your will directs, you will deliver them from evil, preserve them in all goodness, and bring them to everlasting life. O oh God, turn our sorrow into gladness, our mourning into a holiday. Hear and answer us, for we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
It was in November of 1985. Almost 40 years ago now, but the events still haunt me from day to day. It was a regular weekend starting out. Sunday, the rain started. And it rained pretty much the whole day, but nothing really out of the ordinary. A little bit of a hard rain during the night, but it was spread all over the mountainous areas of West Virginia. Come Monday morning, I prepared myself to go to work. I dropped the boys off at school and I headed to the town of Franklin. Now that's about 40 miles driving time from Moorfield to Franklin. Moorfield was where I was living at the time. Throughout the day, the rains continued to come down and at times they were pretty heavy. And come mid-afternoon, there was talk of waters rising and some of the areas, but that wasn't anything new for that time of year. About five o'clock, we noticed some extra activity coming by the state road and the state police in the area, and people were told to go home that roads were starting to be cut off. So I prepared to drive from Franklin back to Moorfield. And as I got to upper track, I realized that the roadway had been covered over by water and there was no way to cross the river, which meant there wasn't really any quick way to go home. Started listening to what stations we could get in that area at the time and it was starting to sound like this was going to be something. So I went back to Franklin and The fellow that was my agent at the time said, just stay with us for the night and things will be better in the morning. So I tried to get a hold of my wife and found out that the phone lines weren't working anymore. So I didn't know exactly what was going on back home. I spent the night but it was not an easy night. None of us were really sleeping in the house. We were up talking and listening and still hearing the rain come down. The next morning we went to the local restaurant and the hotel that was there sitting on the hillside and lots of activity there. And the state police, we approached and asked, well, you know, what's going on in Petersburg and Moorfield and Romney and those areas? And they said, They've all been hit pretty bad over the night. He said, we lost total contact with Moorfield. And that's where the state police barracks were at the time. So it started to worry me a little bit more that there was no contact with the people that I love nor the community that I was a resident of. I ended up spending another night in Franklin still not knowing what the situation was. And by now it was coming around to Wednesday morning and waters were starting to recede a little bit, but still we were finding out that bridges had been washed out, not just the roads around them, but actually taken off their foundations and moved. Moorfield was completely cut off on three of the roads that went into the town. But I did find out that if I wanted to go over into Virginia and up the interstate, to where I could cut over to Wardensville, that I probably could cross the mountain and find my way down into Moorfield by Route 55. Roads that I were pretty familiar with because all of that territory was where I was working with my various agents. So I set out to find my way home on Wednesday. Now normally I could make it Moorfield to Franklin in about an hour but this route was almost five hours of driving to get home. I stopped in Wardensville, hoping that I could find gas, and I did, and a store where I could buy some milk and some bread and a few other things that I thought, well, I might need those. So I drove on into Moorfield, and as I was coming down the hillside, 
and coming into the edge of town, I could see where the water had spread out over the entire town. Main Street and Moorfield had taken over seven foot of water, meaning that just about every house in the valley was touched by damage and water. So I went to William Street, which was where we lived. At that particular time, we were living in a mobile home and William Street was a mobile home park. And as I drove down William Street, I noticed that none of the trailers were there. All of them were gone. And I started talking to people and I found out that some of the mobile homes are just a block down. Some of them were swept all the way down the river and some of them were completely destroyed by the force of the water. So I started searching and I went over by the fire department, which was directly behind my home. And of course, all the fire trucks and everything else were out and there was water in the firehouse. And I could see in the field that was just below that, my mobile home. Somewhat twisted, but still intact. Windows broken out, mud all over. And the saddest thing was looking at my son's bedroom and seeing Paddington Bear hanging out the window. I was devastated. Everything we had was in that mobile home and it was gone. And at this point, I didn't know where my wife and my sons were. As I took stock of the situation and walked around a little bit, I turned around to see two people walking down towards me. My wife was one, my pastor was the other. Now, the parsonage had taken great damage as well. It was just one street over from where I lived. And it was an older antebellum house. So I knew that Andy had his hands full with everything at the parsonage, yet he was out in the community trying to make any contact he could with the people there. And as we came together to where we could talk, there was a little bit of small talk, there were some hugs, there was some exchange, there were some tears. And Andy said, could we pray about all of this? We huddled in a circle, the three of us with arms around each other. And Pastor Andy, led us through a prayer and told us that he was going to open the church that night. He said, yes, we took some damage in the basement, but the sanctuary is still intact. And he said, I think we need to open up. And I said, we'll be there. Well, most of the community was there. I don't really remember ever seeing the church that full, nor was it less full on the following few Sundays? The words and the sermon suggestions from the United Methodist Discipleship Committee had a way of explaining to me much of what went on and continues to stick with me when I recall that particular period of my life. Worship is about God, not really about our needs. Yet there was nothing more of God that night that we could do than to pray. Pastor Andy set aside his sermon that night and then again on the next following Sunday morning, we just prayed and listened to one another. 
We put ourselves in God's hands in those moments and we leaned into his embrace. We poured out our sadness and our fears. We offered up the uncertainty of a world of such suffering and such cruelty. We admitted our anger and our frustration, and we cried out for assistance in whatever form, even as we prayed and were hoping for grace and mercy. Pastor Andy mentioned at the time that we ought to listen to James. We are reminded that James was adamant about prayer in all circumstances. He ends his whole writing, his very task-oriented letter, if you will, by telling us to pray. He says, because we're sick or because we're well, because we're suffering or because we're cheerful, we should pray. Pray with the sighs of our hearts, pray with the songs of our souls, we should pray. And pray together. That was so important in those days, the weeks, even the months following the flood. Together we call on help when our own prayers seem to be bouncing against the ceiling or lost in the clouds above our heads. We like that there were tools to help us in praying. We can pray with our hands. We can lay them upon those who we are praying for. We can pray with the oil of anointing not because that makes the prayer any better or that it lubricates that prayer machinery somehow, but simply because it gives us something to grab hold to. It gives us something to do with our hands. We found James helpful for our praying, mostly. Well, there was that bit where we stumbled where we averted our eyes and wrinkled up our eyebrows. We became a little more cynical and critical. When James seems to confuse praying and sinning or sickness and sin, like our sicknesses are caused by our sin, we know better than that now. We've been raised in a scientific age we know about germs and disease and genetic time bombs, none of which are our fault. It kind of makes us want to dismiss the whole thing. Okay, well, maybe in a healthy lifestyle, choices kind of weigh out our illnesses. And sometimes they can be the result of our actions and our decisions. But that isn't what James is really talking about. He's thinking of a more divine and direct correlation, isn't he? About divine punishment because of bad decisions or even thoughts, right? Well, maybe not. At least for me, I cannot link the serious destruction of floods and hurricanes to the pure decisions and actions of the people that it affects. Because there's a wide diversity of actions both on the good side and the bad. So is that link that we read there or not? Is it that we've put it there or someone who has gone before us has put it there and now we can't get that image out of our heads? What if it isn't about a correlation, but more about an effect? The effect of illness and the effect of sinfulness is the same, or at least it was in James' community. Those who were sick were shunned, quarantined, set aside, and so it was with those who were found to be sinning. Just set them aside, 
excommunicate them. That was the practice that some historians argue, and so it is today. We just don't want those people around, those sinners, those unhealthy ones. Let them keep the problem in Haiti or Mexico, but not the good old USA. Keep the homeless on the other side of the river. Well, maybe the wall is a good idea. <laughs> not. James is trying to tear down that wall, trying to say that even the sick are worthy of our prayers and worth our time. They should call the elders of the church. Now, I want you to take notice it does not say the priests, but the elders. They should call on the community to come and be with them, anoint them, lay hands. Yes, I'm talking about touching. Inclusion. Sinners too, said James. Don't let bad decisions, bad choices, wrong values separate us. Pray for them up close and personal. Include them, invite them. Be invited. Yes, you need the invitation too. If you've separated yourself because you were afraid of what they saw when they looked at you, find a way back, a way to accept the grace that the community wants to pour out on you. Come back and be prayed for and prayed over. Though we hate to admit it, James seems to have more confidence in prayer than we do. We delegate prayer to the pastor or the lay leader, but seldom get on our knees. That's a metaphor. The prayer of faith, he writes, the prayer of the righteous, powerful and effective. The prayer of faith will save the sick. I wonder if we still really believe that. Oh, we've heard on that rare occasion the unexplained miracle, but really can any miracle be explained? I mean, isn't that part of the definition? When someone gets well, despite the predictions to the contrary, many times is a miracle. James seems to think that we should pray for always. Pray and hope and expect. Sure. So why not pray and expect a miracle? Yes, we ought to pray for miracles. But not necessarily miracles tied to this life. Maybe instead we should be praying for the miracles that bring us home. James doesn't say that prayer of faith will heal the sick, but the prayer will save the sick. Save them. That means inclusion in the kingdom of God. It means inclusion in the community of faith. Paul tells us that we were given the ministry of reconciliation. That's our job, not miracles of healing, but miracles of inclusion, miracles of hospitality. We are called to tear down the dividing walls and build up the body. We are called to heal the community, not just the individual. It can be easy but you have to get on your knees. We continue to give our offerings, our tithes, our gifts. 
to God for what God has done in our life and what we know that God will provide in our life going forward. We give thanks for your continuing support of the ministry of First United Methodist Church and the outward reach and the connectivity of the United Methodist Church all around the world. Let us pray. God of the beginning, God of now, and God of what will be. In your claiming us as your own, you have given us the most gracious and powerful invitation. To pray to lift all the weights on our hearts with confidence that you will hear. As we offer gifts to you this morning, we pray that you will dedicate them so that they might bring love, compassion, joy, and mercy to people who are in need. Then remind us that we are not done until we have offered to you the prayers of our hearts. In the name of Jesus, our rock and our redeemer, amen. I share this reflection that's posted in the Christian Aid website and brought to us by way of the United Methodist Discipleship Team. It is a reflection on James 5, 13 to 20, the scripture that you heard this morning. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. A good friend doesn't let you get away with murder, but will speak for you in your defense. A good friend asks hard questions, but stays with you while you struggle with the answers. A good friend sees you at your worst, but still loves you. A good friend has had plenty of practice in forgiving you. A good friend has no illusions about you. He knows you're only human, but still has hopes for you. Everyone needs a good friend. Otherwise, you just go on making the same dreary old mistakes. God of wisdom, God of justice, God of mercy, be our friend.
from your care and your burdens, Jesus will release you. Jesus is our constant companion and friend. Jesus is our Savior. In prayer, we confess to God the things that we won't confess to each other and ask for forgiveness. And through prayer, we know forgiveness is given. What an example for us to forgive our neighbors and our family for the trivial things that we get upset about. What an example of Christianity it is to forgive and to include. Go now with the grace of God. The love that Jesus Christ showed us in his life and the ever-increasing power of the Holy Spirit which you reach through your prayers. Go now in peace. Let us sit as we listen to our postlude. <laughs>